You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. There's been a lot of disagreement and debate about the state of the economy and where we're headed. Are we going to see a big banking collapse because of all the bad commercial loans out there? Are we headed into a recession because of these high rates? And what's going to happen with the housing market? Are prices going to come down? I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. I'm very happy to say we're going to address all of these questions and many more with one of my favorite guests and people, John Chang from Marcus and Millichap. I've been lucky enough to be on his side of the table during debates at the Best Ever Conference. That's coming up, by the way. If you haven't bought a ticket, do it. I'm not being paid to say this. I just love that conference, and I will be there. Uh, John Chang will also be speaking there and you won't want to miss it, but he's also here today on The Real Wealth Show. So here's a little bit about John. He serves as the National Director of Research Services for Marcus and Millichap. They offer some really great videos and education. If you haven't been there, check it out. Under his leadership, Marcus and Millichap has become a leading source of market analysis, insight, and forecasting. He was elected as vice president in 2010 advanced to first vice president in 2013 and promoted to senior vice president of Marcus and Millichap in 2018. And he's here with us today on The Real Well Show. John, welcome back. It's great to have you here. Hey, thanks, Kathy. It's so great to be here again. It's great to have you here. And it's funny because when I had you here last, the questions might be the same as they are today. (laughs) You know, (laughs) lots of people waiting for a collapse of the banking system, waiting for a whole bunch of commercial properties to come online for discounts. And uh, we're just going to get an update on all that with you today. I'm excited. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So let's start with the Fed meeting that just happened in the notes. I mean, everybody knows who the Federal Reserve is today, even if they didn't a few years ago, or what their impact is. So what was their impact this week? Well, so they just had their meeting uh, and uh, they did not move rates in March, as everybody pretty much anticipated at this point. Uh, they did release a dot plot, which is where each of the Fed members says, here's what we think we're going to do with rates over the rest of the year. Uh, and they are still predicting two or three rate cuts at some point in 2024. But, uh, you know, inflation has come down pretty much. Uh, pretty aggressively over the last couple of years, but it's still not where they want to see it. So we still have like core PCE, which is the number they're watching. And the one they want down to 2%, that's at about 2.8. It's been coming down, but it's not there yet. Uh, CPI, the headline inflation numbers at 3.2%. That should get down to around two and a half percent as their target. Uh, again, it's come down a lot. We're not there yet. So they're, they're, they're toying with us and saying, yeah, we'll probably, you know, cut rates at some point this year, two or three times. Personally, I'm guessing, uh, we'll see a rate cut in June. Uh, they'll soft play it. They'll fish it out there and see how it goes. And then, uh, if nothing really changes and the momentum continues, then when the next one will probably be a few months later in September. And then they'll hold a final one in reserve uh, until December, and and maybe we'll see that one, maybe we won't. All right. So why do people care so much about this and hoping? I I mean, one thing you just said is they might cut two to three uh, this year. Two is a new word because they had said three in December, three rate cuts. And a lot of people on Wall Street thought that meant eight. They, they, they turned the three into an eight. Like people are so excited for rates to come down. Uh, why? Well, uh, you know, over the course of 2022 and 23, they structurally changed the lending climate in the U.S. And that affected not just not just real estate, but the entire banking sector, right? So all of a sudden you could go out and get a, a three month treasury with a five and a quarter percent interest rate uh, return on that. And but your savings account was only paying, you know, less than one percent. And so it really impacted the banking sector. It affected real estate. People who had adjustable rate mortgages got caught short. There was all sorts of mayhem, people trying to figure out what to do. And as a result, 
People are anxious to see those rates come back down. Cap rates have come up on real estate a bit. So that's, uh, you know, it's still getting, it's, it's still questionable whether or not you'll be able to get to positive leverage or not. It's pretty close right now, uh, depending on the type of property location, and everything else. But the thing is, is that the belief is that if the Fed starts cutting those rates down a little bit, then the cost of capital will come down a little bit and we can get back into positive leverage territory or at least neutral territory where with the cap rate about on par with what you're paying for your interest rate on your loan, which will allow investors to boost up their yields a little bit. Okay. So again, that was a mouthful, but it really applies to people on adjustable rate mortgages and certainly um, commercial real estate for the most part. So I want to repeat or explain what you just said, uh, cap rates versus where rates are today and what the impact is on commercial real estate. Sure. So we're also, you know, so if you go out and borrow money right now on, on commercial real estate, you're somewhere, depending on what it is, somewhere between Maybe the high fives if you're using Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac financing on a multifamily deal that's in their target area. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, it may be anywhere up to say 8%, uh, on a loan. If it's a construction loan, you might be at 10%. So that's your cost of capital. Now, if you go out and buy a piece of real estate, you may be paying anywhere between, you may be getting a yield, uh, cap rate somewhere between five and seven percent uh for most most of the real estate uh again depends on what it is where it is all that all that sort of stuff but so essentially if your cap rate is lower than the rate on your loan that means all the money you're borrowing you're you're actually losing a little bit of money on that every quarter right so people are trying to avoid that but it's uh it, it, if it moves back into parity at least it's neutral Mm -hmm. If if your cost of your debt and your yield on the real estate going in is even, then you can look at your upside, right? You're not losing ground when you walk in the door. Uh, but I was talking to a lot of investors recently, and over the course of the last 18 months, as I talked to investors, 18 months ago when I talked to investors, like, nope, not doing negative leverage, no way, not happening, then it's gradually changed to the point where they were saying, well, maybe if it's negative leverage for six months and I can get it to a positive leverage point where my cap rate, my return on that property is higher than my cost of capital within six months, then it will work. Then that stretched out. Well, if it's 12 months, that might work. Now even I'm hearing 18 months. If I see a pathway to increasing my return on the real estate to where it is above the cost of my debt within 18 months, I might be willing to do that deal. So it's stretched out over time and it's, it's, uh, becoming more aggressive because there's so much capital out there looking for real estate right now. They're just having to find a way to make that deal work. Uh, how do you, how do you do that? <laughs> you, I mean, either you have to get it at a lower price, right? Acquisition price. You've got to somehow increase the cap rate to get, closer to where rates are. I mean, yeah. How are they doing that? We talked about this last time is there was so much belief that uh, there were going to be great deals in commercial real estate over, over, you know, last year I had that belief too. And yet sellers haven't necessarily come down on price, but some have. So yeah. What are you seeing? If you want a nice office building built in the 1980s in the downtown <laughs> urban area, I'll find you a deal. Right? <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Not happening. And, and the thing is, is there's really no, very little distress out there. So there are some investors who got out over their skis and they're selling off their properties, but the pricing is being bid up because there's so much capital out there. As for how do you go into a negative leverage position? The answer is through value creation. 2024 is going to be all about creating value in real estate. It's rolling up your sleeves. It's whether you're going in and fixing a property up, whether you're retenanting, whether you're improving the management system, uh, you know, for a commercial real estate, maybe you have a tenant in tow that you can bring into a retail center or a, uh, or an office building. Uh, there has to be some dimension of value add. You cannot count 
on the rising tide to lift the boat right now. So it's all about investors who understand how to uh, f- change a property's revenue structure sufficiently to make that number work. So mm-hmm. an investor looks at it and says, okay, I, this thing's uh, uh, going to, the, the cost of the debt's going to be higher than my cap rate going in. But once I get done remodeling the units and I've changed this and changed that, and I put in my, my management system instead of the existing management, get this thing up to full occupancy, uh, boost the rents up a hundred bucks a unit or whatever it is, uh, then this thing's going to be in good shape. And then I will have created value and now it makes money. Uh, so that's the thesis. And the question is, is whether or not the investors have the chops to get that done. So you also mentioned that there's so much money sitting on the sideline ready to scoop up deals, or they are. Some have to. Is that because of 1031s or business sales? Or like, why do they have to buy stuff? They just have to move their money and put it somewhere? Yeah, essentially. So this is not uh, 1031s right now. 1031s actually have come down over the course of the last few years because in order to be in a 1031 exchange, I had to sell something and the, and the transaction activities come way down over the last couple of years. Uh, but there is a lot of money. If you look at wealth in the United States, it is up. When you look at savings, uh, in fact, just before this call, I was looking at what's happening with the savings rate and what, how much capital is going into bank accounts, which are generating a yield now, uh, and, and money market funds. That's actually going back up. So during the pandemic, we saw savings shoot through the roof. Nobody could spend their money. Then as we got out of the pandemic, that was, uh, spent and, and that savings level, the amount of cash and savings started going down and it's moved back into alignment with the long term trend. A lot more money is going into money market accounts and basically. Wealth in the United States, the economy of the United States has been very good. The unemployment rate is very low. Uh, people have found jobs. Wages have been rising. And so there's a lot of money looking for a place to go. Maybe some people put it in the stock market. Other people are putting it in other places. But the amount of capital waiting to get into real estate specifically uh, in the U.S. is about $240, $250 billion right now, which is near a record high. So wow. all of this money is going into these pension funds. It's going into uh, different investment vehicles and institutions. And essentially, those investment groups have to place that money in order to generate yield, in order to not give the money back, right? You, you hear about all these funds that are created. And so there's so much capital trying to get into real estate right now uh, that there's just not enough property to go around. Now, everybody was holding off. Last year, they were like, oh, we're going to see all these opportunities come up. And as you said, those didn't show up. This year, uh, there are still people looking for those opportunities, but there's more capitulation. I hear a lot more investors saying, look, we're just going to have to go out and get this place. We're going to find a place. We're going to find a deal, an apartment, a retail center, uh, maybe an office building where I am getting a big discount and I reposition it uh, or some other type of property, a hotel or something else. And they're trying to get that capital placed so they can put it to work. It's not doing them a lot of good sitting on the sidelines. Right. Um, although maybe they're also just putting it into treasuries where you can still get a decent return, right? Yeah. The treasury is great, right? You can get 5%. That's a, you know, it's a nice coupon clipper. It's a good place to park your money while you're waiting for something else. But, you know, as one investor said to me, you don't get rich investing in treasuries. You're going to generate a return and it's going to be fine, but you don't really have any true upside there. It is what it is. You know what it's going to yeah. be. If you can get into the right real estate, you have some tremendous upside, whether through appreciation or through cash flow that improves over time. And, and that's the beauty of real estate, right? That's why we're all here. That's why we love it. And debt pay down and tax benefits. I mean, it goes on and on, the, the benefits, of course. <laughs> we could sing the praises all day. Um, all right. You Before the show, we talked about a few myths that are still out there. One is that the banking industry, the banking sectors are just going to collapse from all the, all the bad debt. Uh, what's the truth? Yeah. So this keeps showing up. This, this is again, this is one of those zombies that just won't die. The, the <laughs> last year, right? So last year 
we had some banks go under. Now, if you go back and look, even though real estate, everybody talks about real estate in the banking system, none of those banks went under because of the real estate, right? All of those banks went under because people pulled their money out of the bank. And why were they pulling the money out of the bank? Well, because they were afraid that that bank had something wrong, whether it was a fear uh, uh, like well, the First Republic where they were saying, hey, they have a lot of real estate debt and people got afraid and they pulled it out or Silicon Valley Bank where it was simply just a plain old run on the bank. Uh, but at the end of the day, none of that was real estate itself, the performance of the real estate or the loans. That was all about perception and people withdrawing all their money and the banks didn't have anything left. And that's why those banks closed. But ever since that happened, everybody's been talking about the other shoe to drop and they keep talking about real estate. The theory yep. is that we have all these loans out there and they were all uh, done at whatever, three or 4% or their adjustable rate mortgages and they have to refinance in a 7% climate. And basically the idea is that it's going to shove all these investors off the ledge and they're not going to be able to uh, refinance their properties and they're going to have to liquidate and take a loss. But if you look at the value of properties, comparing them to 2019 to current, almost every property type, the, the exception being office, almost every property type is running positive. Their, their values are higher today than they were in 2019. Now, if you bought in 2021 at the height of the market, you may be a little upside down. And if you use an adjustable rate mortgage when you bought it in 2021 and the rates killed you, yes, that investor, it got out too far. They over leveraged. They, they were overly optimistic in their underwriting and they have a problem and they are probably selling off and trying to clear that off the books or they're doing capital calls from their investors trying to, trying to salvage it. But that's the exception, not the rule. And the other thing is, is that last year in June, uh, the FDIC revised their policies to allow banks to extend these loans, just like they did in the, in the yeah. pandemic and the financial crisis. So those loans all get extended. If you look yeah. at the- They don't want insurance, REOs. They don't want to take these properties no, back. They yeah. don't want those properties back. Mm -hmm. The bank's last thing a bank wants to do right now is saying, hey, we're foreclosing on a bunch of bad loans. Guess what happens? Yeah. There's another run on the bank and that bank goes under. So yeah. they're not doing it. <clears throat> so they're extending those loans. And we've seen the maturities that are coming up in 2024 expand uh, significantly uh, since that policy went into place. So basically, we're kicking the can down the road. The fundamentals overall are improving. We're seeing vacancies come down or, or at least remain relatively stable. And we're seeing rents go up, if only a little bit. But in a nutshell, the real estate itself, aside from office, is performing reasonably well, and it's not a cause for major concern. When you look at the bank's balance sheets, only about 25% of their lending is in commercial real estate. Mm. So, and, and if you look at office, for example, that's only about 3.5% of the total lending by banks. So if you say, all right, well, office is going to knock this off. First of all, office, only about less than half of the properties are facing, facing challenges. It's really 1980s construction, large urban towers in the, in the downtown core. Those are the ones that have the most trouble. That's a small portion of the total number of office buildings. And those, if they go into default, that's, there's not enough of them to force the banking system under. So this has been a big myth. It's being perpetuated in the media. I think there's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of investors out there short selling bank stocks or something that are saying, yeah, yeah, it's all going under, <laughs> yeah. But Ooh. in reality, we don't we just don't see it showing up in any of the math so far. All right, another myth is that there is going to be distress soon, and um, specifically, let's talk multifamily because of all the new supply with rents coming down. Is this a concern or is it a myth? <laughs> okay, so first of all, if you look at the CMBS delinquency rate for multifamily, and I use CMBS, uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities uh, debt, because they're the only ones that actually publish this publicly. And so it's the only metric I have. Now, just to put things in perspective, the delinquency rate for multifamily during the financial crisis was about 17%. 
Okay, that's a lot. If you go back, if you look at during the pandemic, it was four and a half percent. If you look at the long term average, kind of from 2016 to 2020, you know, it was running right around three percent delinquency rate. Right now, the delinquency rate for multifamily is 1.8 percent. It's really low. So that is the, the first challenge. With regard to whether or not the, the property is going to have uh, severe headwinds, uh, it's on a market by market basis. You know, you look at the construction, there's huge amounts of construction, record levels of apartment construction, 480,000 new units coming online in 2024. It's a record high, but about half of those are in 10 markets. So if you're in one of those 10 markets, yeah, you got some headwinds there because they're using concessions. They're, they're trying to fill up all those new apartment buildings and that's running, you know, the, the, the brand new buildings cannibalize the A buildings, the A buildings cannibalize the B's and the B's cannibalize the C's and so on down the list. And eventually everybody gets impacted. Everybody's using concessions. Everybody's facing, uh, their effective rent growth as nominal, maybe slightly negative or something else, but all the other markets, Pretty good, pretty stable. You look across the Midwest, most of those markets are reasonably stable right now. So much less risk out there on a macro level, but there are specific submarkets and specific cities that are, that are definitely facing some challenges. I'm in Phoenix. Phoenix is one of those markets that has a huge wave of construction coming online last year and this year. Uh, and, and it's really a dog eat dog world in the apartment rental market right now. But, uh, but at the end of the day, you got to look forward, right? As mm-hmm. real estate investors, we got to look, where are we in five years? when we're exiting this property or seven years or whatever it is for your investment horizon. And you look at a city like Phoenix, you say, yeah, we've overbuilt, the vacancy rates are high, but we have brand new chip manufacturing plants being built that are gonna, you know, gonna employ hundreds of thousands of employees over the course of the next few years. So ultimately the demand drivers are there. When you look at relocations coming into Phoenix, and again, I'm speaking about Phoenix just because it's kind of a, you know, extreme market and, mm-hmm. and I have firsthand knowledge of what's going on here. You, you look at the, uh, in migration to the Phoenix Metro and it's really strong. So ultimately, yes, there is an overhang of supply, but eventually that'll burn off. And you look at markets like Texas, uh, you know, Dallas, you know, Austin, most of them have good metrics over the long term, mm-hmm. but they are facing some challenges today. Yeah, just so many excited investors came in because of all those metrics and again, just overbuilt. I wish there could be a, a better way to control that, you know, in the future, but I guess that's what planning commissions are for. Um, but I'm curious, I was in Phoenix, speaking of Phoenix, yeah. a couple of years ago during the apartment frenzy there. And, uh, and I was, I was meeting with people who were taking motels and convert, converting them into apartments because the, the demand was so strong and the, the new supply hadn't come on yet. And then there became kind of a shortage of hotels because all these motels were turning into apartments. Is that still the case? Because it, like if you went to stay in a hotel, the, it skyrocketed because of that. Well, the thing with, with hotels is their occupancy levels are almost back to uh, peak levels. Mm-hmm. They're a little bit lower, uh, and, and, but their revenue uh, per, uh, per day is, uh, is basically at a record high. So mm. hotels are doing very well. The, the math to convert them really doesn't work right now, especially in Phoenix, right? Because mm-hmm. the because the multifamily market has softened up and the hotel market is super hot. So it's, it's really those, those types of situations aren't existing. Now there are some markets where it still might make sense, but uh, I don't think so. Not really in Phoenix at this point. But there's not necessarily a shortage of, of motels or hotels there. No, I wouldn't say there is. No, okay. the, I, again, it depends on the the type of units. The ones that are good for conversion, uh, you know, whether it's an extended stay of some sort or something mm-hmm. like that, those are the ones uh, that that are going to be easiest to convert. And I don't know that uh, specifically that there is any real shortage per se, although mm-hmm. there are a lot of investors looking for those properties to try to actually keep them as hotels right now. 
Okay. All right. And then myth number three is that we're in a recession and they're just not telling us. And the jobs report isn't real. It's fake. It's, it's part-time jobs. I mean, these are all things I'm sure you hear and I hear all the time. Thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. When you look at, <laughs> at the, at the jobs uh, numbers, well, okay, let me, let me go all the way to the, the top of the list. Let's talk about GDP, right? So everybody thought we were going to be in a recession right now. And that was a, a strong belief, a, basically. By most a people. Year. Right? Yeah, a year and a half ago, you look at all the economist forecast, the blue chip economist forecast was saying we are in a recession late 23 going into 2024. Basically, 80 percent of the economists all agreed that now it's the other way around. 80 percent are saying <laughs> no, no recession, no recession in 2024. Uh, soft landing is the prediction. The consensus uh, economic forecast for 2024 is among the blue chip economists is 2.3% growth, which is great. That's, fa- that's a really solid number. You look at the jobs report and yes, people are like, Hey, no, that's all baloney. But the fact is, is that, that they have a standardized reporting system. You have an ADP report, which is independent. You have a, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics number coming out. They bounce around a lot, but they're all saying that we're still adding jobs. You look at the unemployment rate, which is done by a completely different group and, and, and reported out there, uh, through a completely different survey methodology. Uh, unemployment rates at 3.9%. It's up a little bit, but that's still very, very low. Uh, you look at the JOLTS data, the job openings, the labor force turnover report, uh, and it's still saying that we have more job openings available, uh, than we have people looking for work. Those numbers all tell me that things are going good. You look at the savings rate. I mentioned this earlier. Savings is way up. The amount of money people have in the bank and in money market is going up. You look at retail sales. On an inflation-adjusted basis, they're basically flat right now, but they're at a record high. So to argue that we're actually in a recession is a big stretch (laughs) because every metric I look at it's not the best ever. It's not the highest I've ever seen. And it's not growing that fast because the Fed doesn't want it to grow. They're, yeah. they're purposely trying to slow this down. And it is slowing down, but it is still positive. And so the metrics are saying that, hey, we're going to have a slow growth year, but probably not a recession. We could. There could be a shock to the system. There could be some black swan event, whatever. There's always something out there that could happen that could go wrong. But generally speaking, if nothing really significant changes, then we get to a soft landing and then we move into a new growth cycle. So again, as an investor, if I'm looking there and I'm looking at it going, okay, we go to a soft landing and then we go into the next growth cycle. The cap rates are still too low, but they're not going to go up that much. Really, honestly, we're pretty much done with the repricing. That's already pretty much taken place. And then you look at the cost of capital. Cost of capital probably will go down. That is a recipe for putting capital work today. Mm -hmm. All right. If you think about it, right? If I, if you sit down and just said, okay, in the future, the economy is going to grow stronger. There's going to be more jobs. There's going to be growth. We're uh, going to, prices are not going to go down anymore. They may go down a little bit, but on an isolated basis, but in general, they're not going to go down anymore. And my cost of capital, I can refinance later and it will go down maybe a little bit. And my returns are what they are. They're going to be small at first, but they grow over time as I get my rent growth and my vacancies and my value add, uh, roll up my sleeves and get these properties turned the right direction. That is a recipe for success. And the challenge is, is that in people's minds, they're thinking about, oh, there's another shoe to drop. There's a recession. We're actually in a recession. They're lying to us. Whatever it is that's <laughs> holding them back, they're just simply waiting on the sidelines and, and they'll miss the opportunity. So uh, yeah. it always happens. Yeah. I mean, honestly, people who are saying that are just not players is the best way I can say it, because everyone I know who is a player and is playing, right? <laughs> they don't stop. <laughs> well, I, I, I was on the phone with an investor uh, last week and, and he tends to be a cup half empty kind of guy. And mm-hmm. he was talking about, oh, you know, Joanne Fabric and the price of gold is going up and all the, all these other things. And, but at the end of the day, well, what are you doing? Oh, I'm buying real estate because it's a great time to buy. 
Well, of course it is. He's a, he's a seasoned investor. He knows what he's talking about. Even though he has a, a negative perspective on things, he still believes the real estate's good. Interesting. Wow. Okay. Okay. One final question, because I've taken too much of your precious time and I'm just so grateful you're here, but single family, we've got, uh, you know, a lot of single family landlords listening to this show. Thoughts on, on buying now and what's in store? You know, I, I actually went back and listened to uh, the, our conversation two years ago, just as all of this stuff was hitting. And there was a lot of speculation at the time as the interest rates were surging that the housing market would collapse. And actually on that conversation, we're like, no, it's not. It's going to come <laughs> down a little bit, but it really is not going to be reset. This is not going to be that time when everybody, everything drops. And, and the reason is because of demographics, because of housing demand and the ultimately the supply shortage that we, uh, we continue to face. So arguably, Home prices, which are up about 5% on a year-over-year basis, or basically back to where they were just before they started raising rates aggressively. Uh, they did go down uh, about 5%, and they're back up to about where they were. Uh, but we are at a, a slightly above now. It's a record high home price right now. The home sales are slow. They're basically below that where they were at the pandemic. But I do anticipate that home prices are going to continue to go up over time, especially if the Fed reduces rates. The demand drivers, basically by demographics, are going to uh, keep the housing market up. Now, there are some caveats to this. They can't move that much. They're not going to go up really fast. The reason is only about 25% of U.S. households can qualify for the loan on a median priced home right now. That is like a record low. It's never been that low. Because of the interest rates, because of the home prices, because of the incomes, the pool of prospective buyers for that first time home purpose to get a first time home buyer is, is really, really small. So the impetus to drive demand is thinning. And again, this is part of the argument why the multifamily market is going to be so strong over the next few years is because the spread between the payment on a median priced home and the average rent in the U.S. is at an all time high. Yeah. It's over $1,300. Your house payments over $1,300 greater than it is on the average apartment rent. And so affordability is going to be a problem, but they're not building enough homes to meet the demand. We're still, yeah, even though we're hitting record multifamily construction, we still have a shortage of about three and a half million houses. Uh, and as we have uh, population growth, we're just not keeping up with demand. So the housing market is going to continue to be healthy and, and on the rise. I think what's happening with the realtors and the, and the, and the, uh, the brokerage fees that they charge is going to be a little bit of a sideshow. It's going to scramble up the market a little bit over the short term, but the fundamentals themselves still point to more demand for housing than there is supply, which keeps the prices yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And it's a, kind of the same conversation in, in single family is you're not getting the best deal. You know, you're not going to have the cash flow you used to have. You're not maybe getting the, the price you might have been at. Well, you know, you, you can still negotiate. There's not as much competition. We certainly have. But you, it's, you said it over time. That's when you create wealth because over time, the rents do go up. It's not going to be overnight, but because of demand, uh, and for all the reasons you just said, um, you just got to hold it. If you're flipping, that's a different thing. If you're in it for the short term, you got to look at, you know, the short term. But if you're in it, like most of our, my listeners for the long term, over time, you will become wealthy buying single family or commercial, right? <laughs> Either way. Well, I, think, I think they're both fantastic. Personally, I buy, I have a bunch of single family homes that I've invested in. It's really hard to buy one right now because they, you go mm -hmm. in and the rents aren't covering your yeah. cost of your debt. And so it's, uh, at least where I am. So it's very difficult to find houses to buy right now. Uh, but if you do find something that's going to have positive cash flow out of the shoot, you may, you're going to have to put it down a larger down payment. You may be doing 30, 40% uh, instead of 25. But if you can get to a positive leverage position going in, 
then you're going to be in a good position over the long term as that housing demand continues to be strong. Uh, and again, I, I don't anticipate values dropping uh, anytime soon, uh, just because at the end of the day, we have 72.2 million millennials out there. They're all in their 30s and 40s. They all need housing. They're forming new households. About a year ago, we saw a real reduction in household formation uh, because of the inflation and people were worried about a recession. But that has started to reignite and reaccelerate. We're seeing household formation climb. Consumer sentiment, a leading indicator of that, is moving in the right direction. So we anticipate that the demand for housing is going to be on the rise over the course of 2024 and into 25 which ultimately will bolster and sustain the values of the single family market as well as multifamily. Good stuff. <clears throat> really good stuff. All right, John, thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Well Show. And anybody who wants to see John live, um, you still have a little bit of time to get to the Best Ever Conference in April. I highly recommend it. I don't know if there's tickets left, but you'll get to, you'll get to see the legend in person. <laughs> All right, Thanks, John. Kathy. Thank pleasure. you so much. All right. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. You know, we have actually been able to find a lot of properties that do cash flow, partly because we've either been able to negotiate the price down or negotiate the interest rate down or both. And many of our members at Real Wealth are doing that now. We've had record sales. It's been a really good year. And one of the secret weapons is that we've been working with a bank that um, our partners and partner builders have used to buy down rates to as low as four, four and a half percent. And that really makes the numbers work on, in many cases, brand new townhomes, fourplexes, duplexes, uh, really, really great properties. You can find out more about that at realwealthshow.com. Talk to one of our investment counselors there. They all invest in these markets with these teams. They speak to hundreds of investors, at, not every day, but um, over a period of time, they speak with a lot of our members. We have over 60,000 now, uh, and they know which teams, which builders, which property managers are really performing, and they can share that information with you. And it's free. Just go to realwealthshow.com. I'm Kathy Becky. Thanks again for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.